Hello everyone, I'm Amy Daniels, Project Manager for SPARC. Today we are privileged to have Bridget Taylor with us speaking about safety skills for children with autism. Bridget is co-founder and executive director of Alpine Learning Group, a school for students with autism that is approved by the New Jersey Department of Education. She is also senior clinical advisor for Rethink, which provides a comprehensive web-based curriculum, training, and data tracking platform for special educators and ABA providers. Dr. Taylor has been specializing in the education and treatment of children with autism for the past 27 years. She is a board-certified behavior analyst and a licensed psychologist. It is our extreme pleasure to have Bridget with us today, so without further ado, please take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining today. I have a lot of information to share with you in a relatively short period of time. I wanted to be able to discuss safety issues with you, talk a little bit about why children with autism may be at risk for safety issues. I'll briefly talk about some of the research base that is current in teaching safety skills to children with autism, and then we'll talk about some skills that you can teach and how to develop an individualized safety plan. I want to start by talking about a couple cases at Alpine that got us thinking about the importance of safety. An example would be one of our students, Sarah, four years old at the time, wanted to go to the library. Her mom didn't know she wanted to go to the library, and she left her house unassisted. She was missing for over an hour and had to cross a major highway in order to go to the library. You can imagine that this parent was very distressed about her child, being, her child missing. She was later found by the police officer walking home with a book in her hand. So needless to say, we were very concerned about this child and about her leaving her home, and we began to think about strategies to help Sarah and her family from preventing this from occurring again in the future. We then had an unfortunate, very unfortunate incident of one of our students passing away due to drowning. Unfortunately, this, this child left a vacation home that had a lake in the backyard and uh, unfortunately drowned. The parent was uh, uh, briefly, very, very briefly unavailable in the home and the child happened to get outside. So I, I, I uh, discussed these two cases to illustrate the importance of addressing safety in individuals with autism. These, uh, on, these cases uh, really illustrate the, the need for us to develop a technology to ensure safety, but also to teach skills to children with autism to ensure or increase the likelihood that they will be safe. So what are some of the safety concerns? You might be concerned, for example, about elopement or wandering in the community. Children with autism often fail to understand safety and danger in general. So you might have children with autism who climb. This little, uh, little uh, guy here like to climb up on furniture, and you can see the, that this could be an unsafe behavior. You might have children who ingest non-edible items, so there's concern for poison, uh, for, for somebody uh, getting uh, being poisoned by something that they eat or medications that they might ingest in their homes. So this general failure to understand safety can lead to, can, can lead to dangerous situations for the child with autism. There are also concerns about abduction, so children with autism may wander and then be abducted. There may be concerns around sexual assault, drowning, fire safety. So these are just some common concerns that fa families will talk about with regard to safety for their child with autism. So why are children with autism at risk for safety? We know, for example, children with autism have trouble understanding language. And so we're not able to explain to them things like, if you run into the road, you might get hit by a car. That's a lot of language for a child to understand who has a language deficit. They also have difficulty communicating. So if a child wants to go to a library, in the case of Sarah, if she wanted, when she wanted to go to the library, she was unable to tell her mom that she wanted to do so, and she just left. There's also lack of awareness of just environmental, just cues in the environment that might signal danger. Somebody walking too close behind them, knowing how far they've strayed from their parent. So that difficulty in understanding those social cues or making discriminations, for example, about when they're lost and when they're not lost can lead to safety concerns. Children with autism are sometimes not compliant with their parental requests, so families will ask children to come here or to stop, and the child doesn't respond to those cues because they have some non-compliant behavior, and we can have some safety concerns there as well. Children with autism engage in challenging behavior that put them at risk for safety concerns.
for example, if a child likes to climb furniture, as in the case of my little friend here on the picture, this can be a safety concern. If the child engages in pica, which is the ingestion of non-edible items, or has destructive behavior, for example, likes to take things apart or throw things, if they engage in escape behavior by running away from tasks, these challenging behaviors put them at risk for safety concerns. Children with autism might have preoccupations with certain idiosyncratic items that put them at risk for safety concerns. So for example, a child might be very interested in water, and if that's the case, there's an increased risk for drowning. A child might be fascinated with locks or latches, and that might lead to elopement because the child is going to be curious about opening doors and unlocking locks. We have children who might be fascinated with fire, and there's set fire safety concerns there, or eating objects that are non-edible. There, there would be concern for poisoning. Some of our children become very interested in electronic or mechanical items, and there might be concern for electrocu electrocution. And then there are some children who have concern, who have over-interest in cars or trains, and there might be elopement to go see cars and trains, and there could be an accident. So again, I'm I'm pointing these out for you to begin to think about if you have a child who has over-interest in certain items or activities, we want to make sure that that over-interest in items and activities doesn't put them at risk of danger. Children with autism also have sensory sensitivities, which might lead to them escaping in escaping certain things that would increase safety. So for example, if a child doesn't like to wear a safety belt in a car because of the sensory experience of what it feels like, might refuse to wear a safety belt, which puts that child at risk for increased harm if there's an accident. Or some children don't like to wear safety gear when they're riding their bike or rollerblading or roller skating, and that would put them at risk for injury. Now, if we look at some data, these data were taken in 2010, and the data, the, the question was asked, has there ever been a safety goal listed in your child's IEP? 81% of those parents said no, which is an indication that these goals are not, goals for safety are not showing up in educational IEPs. On the other hand, parents who express concern about safety issues with their child with autism is at 93%. So you see this real disparity between what parents are reporting in terms of concern and the, the goals that reflect an increase, to, goals that reflect ways to increase safety of individuals with autism are not showing up in educational IEPs. And so we really need to think about how we can incorporate goals into IEPs to increase safety. So what can parents and professionals do? Well, I believe that addressing safety involves assessing not only the individual with autism, but also the home and the community. So one has to engage in a thorough assessment of the home and community to make sure there are not safety concerns within the home or community, but also looking at the skill development of the child with autism. It also requires a proactive approach, so thinking ahead and identifying what you can do to increase safety across all environments and what kinds of skills your child should be taught to decrease harm and to increase the likelihood they will be safe across environments. It will require that somebody it will require that you might address behavior that your child engages in that you're concerned about that poses safety concerns and also skills that you'll want to teach to increase the safety of the individual with autism. So let's take one area of concern, elopement. So I'm sure if I, I asked you and I was able to see you in an audience, are you concerned about your child wandering away from you, a lot of you would raise your hand. This is a very common problem, particularly with younger children with autism, where they might wander away from caregivers without consent or leave an area without permission, and they might run or dart away. And so a child might have darting or running behavior that's not really to escape something, but more to um, engage in a self-stimulatory behavior of pacing or um, running back and forth. And again, they're leaving the area where their parents are and where their supervision. It's very prevalent. Um, in 2001, a study by Hombergers and colleagues found that 80% of children with autism spectrum disorder elope. And there's a lot of research on elopement that's been done that, is, that have looked at how often they attempt to elope and what kind of danger they might be in. And here's some data, we won't go over, to, over it in great detail, but you can see that of a survey, 
uh, 49% of the children were reported to elope at least once after the age of four. If you look at that in comparison to these children with autism to their siblings, you can see that there's less of a, of a risk for the sibling and more of a risk for the child with autism. Now, from a behavioral perspective, there has been some work in understanding the function of elopement and why children might run away from an area. And so a study by Kathleen Piazza and colleagues in 1997, one of the first to do what's called a functional analysis of elopement, identified that elopement can serve several functions. For example, a child might be eloping to gain access to social attention. And so when a child runs away, he likes to be chased, and that chasing is a form of social attention. A child might elope, and also, a child might elope to, get, to escape a demand or something that they don't like. So they're running away from a, a situation that they don't want to be in. Or they might run to gain access to a tangible item. So in the case of Sarah, Sarah eloped because she wanted to get a book, and that is a tangible item that she was seeking. The good news is, is that, in, as indicated in this study, is that they were able to decrease elopement by teaching functional communication training. For example, teaching them ways to ask for social attention, teaching them ways to ask for the tangible item, and then blocking elopement and reinforcing them when they didn't elope. And so the, the research seems to indicate that you can identify functions of elopement and then develop treatments based on function. These are just some other studies where similarly they looked at the assessment and treatment of elopement across a variety of different contexts. And so I point you to this literature so that you know that there are behavior analysts who are doing work in this area to really try to understand what is the function of elopement, what can we do to decrease elopement, how can we go about addressing it from a functional perspective. So I believe when we address issues of safety is that safety really begins at home. And so what I would encourage you to do after today's presentation is to look around your home and identify things that might pose a safety risk for your child. And um, at the end of the lecture, I'm going to talk to you and point you to uh, a, sa a safety skills assessment that we use here at the school, which will guide you to look at various things around the house that might impact safety. For example, are there safety locks on windows and doors? to prevent elopement? Are there door chimes or alarms to indicate when the door is open? Are there window guards? Are the gates locked on yards and on the fences in a yard? So making sure that your home is secured from a safety perspective to prevent elopement. I'm going to point you in the direction of some technology that I have found. I think it's important to note that technology evolves over time and it gets better and better. And so I encourage you to look at this website. It's called MyPreciousKid.com, and it will point you to some safety tools that you can install in your home to increase safety. These are just a few that I've pulled from, uh, from the Internet. So using devices such as a, a window alarm can alert you to when the window is open in the event that your child knows how to open a window in order to elope. I believe it's really important to keep emergency responders in your community informed that you have a child with autism. And so what we recommend is that the parents inform the local emergency personnel that a child with autism is living in your home, provide them with a picture and information for how to contact you, and let the emergency responders know that your child is at risk for wandering or elopement. That's really important so that in the event that your child goes missing, they will know that uh, your child is an elopement risk, what he looks like, and, and potentially how to contact you should they find him. It's, uh, there's a couple of websites that you can register with. There is a form called the Autism Elopement Form that can be found at a website called aware.org and a website called Child Find Form at www.kindfind.com. And these forms are helpful because it's information that you can fill out to provide to your local your, uh, emergency responders. You can also register your child with the National Child Identification Program. 
There is an ID kit which provides detailed instructions how to get fingerprints. This again increases the likelihood that your child will be found in the event that he wanders from home. And these websites can provide useful information for, ho for how to go about identifying, developing identification kits for your child. I mentioned AWARE before. The acronym stands for the Autism Wandering Awareness Alerts Response and Education Program. It's a collaboration of six national nonprofit autism organizations whose mission is to reduce autism-related wandering incidents and deaths. You can go on this website. It will provide you with prevention tips and safety tips and resources. I highly recommend that this site in terms of uh, some additional information. I also advocate for informing your neighbors. I realize that this is a personal decision and you may not want to let your neighbors know that a child with, that you have a child with autism, but I if your child is a wanderer or, or might elope, particularly if the if your neighbors have pools, let them know about your child that he has a propensity to wander and that they should have a picture or know what he looks like and a number to call in the event that they see your child walking without uh, another adult. Know your child's preferred communities, uh, locations. So with the, in the case of Sarah, her, her mom knew that she really liked the library, and that was one of the first places she directed the police to go to to look for her. So if you know your child likes the train store, know the route that your child might walk to get to the train store, and it would probably be the route that your car takes because chances are your child will memorize that route. So know which community location they're more likely to go to because that may be where they end up going if they happen to elope. I strongly advocate that all children with autism wear a medical alert bracelet that says that they have autism and how they can contact you. This is particularly important for individuals with autism who may not have fully articulated uh, intelligible language and so they're not able to say what their name is and what your phone number is. And so we suggest that all families have their child wear a medical identification bracelet. Now some families will say, oh, he'll never keep it on, he doesn't like it, he resists wearing it. And you'll have to have the child get used to it, but all the children over time get used to having these types of bracelets. It's a matter of perseverance and, and shaping their toleration of wearing something around their wrists. And you can see I've provided you here with different types of identification jewelry. There are also child tracking devices that you can look into. They, um, some work better than others. We have several families here whose children have uh, pretty sophisticated tracking devices that they wear or have with them at all times. Um, as with any technology, it's going to be evolving over time and getting better and better, but there's also glitches with technology. Batteries run dead, so on. They need to be charged. So there's all kinds of challenges with, with technology, but I point these out to you to know that they do uh, exist. This is a uh, very cheap alternative GPS system, uh, alternatives to the GPS systems. These are just uh, simple security devices where the child would wear one piece, you would have the other piece, and when he wanders too far away from you, it will signal you by chiming. So some of the families will use this in parks. If the child is supposed to stay within 10 feet of the parent, if he goes beyond the 10 feet, the signal alerts the parent to go and have the child come back to the area where she wants him to be. There are global positioning systems and tracking systems that are much more uh, sophisticated. Project Lifesaver is not available in every state. The child would wear a battery-operated wrist transmitter that emits a silent tracking signal every second, and that has to be hooked up with uh, local uh, police officers who, who can come in and reset the device and so on. So it requires interfacing with, with uh, emergency personnel. There's a Care Track International device. There's another GPS child locator watch. So I'm, again, I'm pointing these all out to you. I, I don't have an opinion on any of these in terms of which one would be best or which one works best, but I point them out to you to make you aware that there is an emerging and growing technology that is, that is being developed to address wandering, to address elopement, and in order to increase safety and to have children be united with their parent much faster than if they weren't wearing these devices. 
You know that your cellular phone, of course, has various tracking apps that you can use. Um, there's something called MyBuddyTag.com. There's the Find Fr Friends uh, port app that's on your uh, – if you have a smartphone, that's usually on a, um, an iPhone. And you can um, use these devices, but again, sometimes – there's the, there's, there might be the worry that, that there may not be a, a, a cell signal for it to be transmitted. So again, with, with all technology, there's the risk of it malfunctioning and not working. But if you have concerns about elopement and wandering, I encourage you to look at some of this technology and see if there is uh, one that might be more suited for your child. There are even, even clothing products that people have developed. So uh, this uh, site here, you can see the clothing has QR codes that can be in, that can be sewn into clothing, so that if the child is found, that QR co code can be read, and uh, it has your identifying or the child's identifying information. So people really are going at a lot of lengths here to try to increase safety of individuals who might have elopement issues. In terms of poisoning, it, this is uh, again an area that you might want to consider if you're particularly if your child likes to eat substances that are non-edible and we know that poisoning is a real concern among typically developing children you can see that every day 374 children in the United States between 0 and 19 are treated for poisoning um, we don't have specific data on individuals with autism but it's important that if you do have issues around concerns around potential poisoning with your child with autism, that you keep the national poison control numbers near your phone, and that you can call uh, in the event that uh, your child ingests something. So for example, here at the school, um, we had one child ingest um, some type of, it was a material used to paint, but it wasn't actually a watercolor, water-based paint, and we had to call poison control and list what the substance was, and they were able to tell us that, it, thankfully, it was non-poisonous. So you want to be able to have this number readily available if you have concerns about your child. It's important that you expand your idea of what poison is to include not just Drano, but things like medicines or household cleaners, sometimes plant food. Uh, we have one child where we had to remove all plants from his home because he would ingest the plants, the leaves of the plant, and these plants were, in fact, when we did some research, poisonous. And so you want to make sure that you cleanse your home of any item that potentially that your child could potentially ingest if you have concerns about this. And we suggest that any item that's poisonous be labeled with the same sticker so that you know and everyone else in the family knows and that you make an effort to keep these items in a locked cabinet. Sometimes we have families put them in a locked cabinet within another cabinet because kids are, are very sophisticated sometimes and are able to um, figure out a way to unlock certain cabinets and, and, and things that might have locks on them. So this might be an example of a box that we would use for families to lock medications or substances up in. Again, it's uh, something that the child might not be able to access here. This is a, a box that actually has um, the type of lock that you can set different codes so that they wouldn't know what the code was each time. One of the programs that we run with children with autism is to help them to know what's dangerous and what's not. So we do just what's called discrimination training to help children learn what's off limits versus what's not off limits. And we'll do simple discrimination training with things like saying things like which one can you drink, which one can't you drink, and why. And again, these we might start with pictures because we don't want to start with the actual substance. Then we might go to the actual object that's empty, that doesn't have any more of the contaminated substance in it, a poisonous substance in it. But we would run actual discrimination training to, to help the child understand this is something you shouldn't touch, this is something that you can touch. You, you do drink soda, you're allowed to touch soda, but you're not allowed to touch the Lysol. So what does the research tell us about how to teach safety? Well, the good news is, is that children can be taught safety skills. Most studies have used what's called behavioral skills training. Sometimes behavioral skills training is used in combination with other technologies such as video modeling or practicing in vivo in certain contexts. Behavioral skills training involves providing instructions to the child with autism about what's expected, what's not expected, modeling the responses, role-playing those responses, providing feedback, simulating what needs to be done in the context, 
and then actually going in and practicing in the context. You can imagine that teaching skills related to safety poses uh, some concerns in itself. So for example, if we want a child to maintain safety responses while walking on a sidewalk in a street, on a street, we want to be careful that we provide lots of upfront training before we actually go with him on the, on the, sidewalk, in the, on the sidewalk at the street because we want to make sure the child is safe with us. So we would practice and role play in what are called simulated training contexts, and then we would go and practice in the actual context. So we want to make sure a certain amount of skill is acquired before we actually go in the context where he has to practice that skill. So some of the studies that were, have been conducted, in this study by Summers and colleagues, she taught three children with autism to get an adult when the doorbell rang, and another three to leave an area when there were hazardous, hazardous chemicals that were present, and they had to tell an adult. So I really like this study because it taught two very functional skills. The first skill was when the doorbell rings, I don't go and open it. I tell my mom that there's someone at the door, or I tell my dad or somebody else that somebody's at the door. So this teaches the child that when the doorbell rings, you don't just open it, you go and get another adult. In the second part of the study, they taught the child when you see how an item that they've determined to be hazardous, that they should leave the area and tell a parent. So rather than playing with the item or potentially ingesting the item, they were taught when you see this thing, you should go tell somebody. So this, again, gets to that idea of discrimination training. When you see something hazardous, walk away, don't play with it, don't ingest it. So I like this, um, this study as an example of, of teaching very, two very specific skills. In another study, uh, they taught first aid skills to children with autism. And so they taught them when somebody's hurt or if you yourself have a uh, cut or a bruise that you should engage in certain safety responses such as putting a Band-Aid on. And so they taught the child what to do in contexts where first aid was required. There have been several studies that have taught children with autism to, res to what to do if there are lures from strangers. And a lure just means somebody trying to get you to do something, to go with them. So a stranger approaching another, a, a stranger approaching a child in a car, does the child know to immediately walk away, to say no, or to find an adult? And so in this study by Gumby Carr and LeBlanc, they taught three children to respond to the lures of strangers by using behavioral skills training. And they taught the child with video modeling as well and live modeling how to say no when a stranger approaches them and to run away and tell an adult. In another study, some of my colleagues in Turkey taught children how to respond to lures of strangers in a similar way. They taught them to go and get their mother or go and get their parent if somebody approached them and said, come with me. For example, the, the, there were various lures that were presented by the strangers. Again, these strangers are actors who are approaching the children. They're not real strangers. For the purposes of the study, they're actors. And they would say things like, your mother said you should come with me, you should come with me to McDonald's, or just come with me. And we call these different types of lures. One might be an authority lure, an incentive lure, or a general simple lure. And so I like this study because we used a variety of lures to try to get the child to, to engage in the response. And in this study, they taught the child to say no and to walk away or leave the area. So these two studies illustrate that uh, abduction prevention can be taught to children by teaching them these skills of saying no and running away when they're approached by somebody they don't know when that person asks them to do something they shouldn't do. In another study, the, uh, again, a, a more recent study, they used different lures as well. And so again, I'm, I'm pointing these studies out to illustrate to you the good news is, is that these skills can be taught. Now, the data on generalization, which means do we know if they learn these skills that in the actual context of somebody who is not an actor approaching them, do they actually work? Well, those data, of course, are not available because nobody knows the exact, uh, we're, all of these folks who are doing these studies are working to keep these individuals as safe as possible, and nobody's exposing them to the real threat or danger. So the idea is, is you teach your child as much skill as possible with the hope and the, and the intent to have them have the skills to to be able to prevent an abduction, or if they happen to wander, to give them the skills necessary to be able to leave if a stranger approaches them. So in this example, children learned fire safety. And so through modeling and rehearsal, 
these researchers taught children with autism to evacuate and to notify an adult when they heard a fire alarm signal. And so here, children with autism learned fire safety. We have conducted several studies at Alpine Learning Group where we taught children with autism to approach a novel adult in the community if they were separated from their teacher or separated from their parent. So children with autism have difficulty knowing when they're lost. They can't make that discrimination. And so what we did in our first study in 2004, we taught them if, the, if they were wearing a pager and the pager vibrated, that that meant they were separated from their teacher and they should approach an adult and communicate that they needed some assistance. In a follow-up study in 2009, we did the same thing, but this time used cell phones because the technology had evolved. And when we talk about ways to use cell phones later on, you'll see that the technology has gotten really sophisticated, that you can use cell phones as a way to increase safety by having the parent reunite with the child um, much more efficiently. Some of the challenges associated with teaching safety is that children with autism have general skill deficits. So they might not, for example, be able to imitate others. And so that failure to imitate might lead to challenges in teaching them how to engage in a safety response if they can't imitate by, by duplicating our model. It's also tough to simulate real life scenarios. So often we have to use set up situations in order to have them be, experience a risk and then we have to make sure they're safe even in the risk, even while we're engaging in uh, role play. There are, of course, uh, limited opportunities sometimes to practice these skills. And so when we're practicing fire safety, we, we're certainly not going to set a fire. We're going to simulate, but we have to set those sim situations up. For example, in our adult program for some of our adults who are learning to live independently, we set up safety, fire safety sessions where we might use a smog machine so that they have the experience of what might be smoke, and again, it's simulated, come into a room and to know what to do when that's, that fog, which we're using to simulate smoke, is in the environment to know to leave the environment. So again, there may be limited opportunities to practice the skills. So you have to set things up and practice under, under uh, environments where the, the safety of the individual with autism is protected, but yet may not actually simulate what's going on in the real world in those, those areas of potential harm. There's also difficulty with our children, our students, in terms of generalizing skills. And so we might teach and practice and role play, and then we have to hope that skill will generalize in the real world. But there are issues with generalization, we know, with children with autism. And so we have to work towards making our training environment look as close to the real environment as possible. So uh, children with autism have difficulty making discriminations, knowing a stranger versus someone they should talk to, knowing which items are dangerous, which items aren't, knowing how far is too far from a parent or a teacher, and also knowing when they're lost or not lost. All of us, when we're driving around, of course this is before we had Google Maps and ways to tell us where to go, we know when we're lost, something signals to us that we are not in a location that's familiar to us. We're trying to get somewhere. We're able to, we know when we're in that situation. For a child with autism to actually identify the signals that tell him that he's lost is often challenging. So let's talk about specific skills that you can teach. And we're going to go through these pretty quickly because I'm going to show you some video. So we start with very basic skills like holding the hand of an adult. So a lot of our children come to us, our new students, they don't want to hold our hand and they don't want to hold their parents' hand. And so we teach them how to hold hands just so that we have a safety response, particularly for our very young children, that they can engage in hand holding out in the community. We teach them to stay with an adult when we're walking with them through the, in the community, to responding to directions like come here to be able to ask for certain things like asking someone to come with them to a desired item, to wait in an area, to answer social questions, to follow different instructions such as get down please, for example, if a child likes to climb, to keep a seatbelt on, to swim. We recommend that all families teach children, uh, take children to swimming lessons. And now there are, uh, which is great, there are swim programs for people with, with autism and various disabilities, and so teaching your child to swim can increase, of course, safety around areas where there might be lakes or pools. Understanding various safety signs, 
responding appropriately to safety signs? Do they know not to touch poisonous items? Again, we're going through these quickly just so you can get an idea of some things to think about. Knowing how to wait at a curb before crossing a street. Do they lock the bathroom door when they go in to use it? In a school environment, there's a lot of toilet training going on, and there are adults in bathrooms at all times because of the toilet training. We want to make sure that child learns a safety response, increases their privacy by teaching them to actually lock the, bath the stall door when they go in. Can they answer a cell phone? Can they state where they are on the cell phone? Can they text their location on the cell phone? These are all skills that we would want to teach to increase safety. Can they identify a familiar versus a stranger? Can they say no when they're offered food or an activity from a stranger? Can they label their body parts and, so that they're able to report any injury that might have occurred? Can they recall and tell you, for example, what just happened? So some of our, our learners don't have the verbal behavior to be able to say what just happened, and that's a skill that has to be taught. If your child has uh, verbal ability, you might teach them to, to be able to answer questions about something that just took place, and then, of course, to be able to use language to, to tell you where it is that they want to go to decrease the likelihood that they might leave an area unattended. Can they discriminate good touch and bad touch? Do they know how to request privacy? Do they know how to call or leave a location if there is an emergency? Do they know how to respond to lures from strangers by saying no and running away? Again, these are all skills that you might want to target. So one skill that we might teach is to teach the child to stay with an adult. We use a variety of instructions like walk with me or stay with me. We prompt the child to stay alongside us while we're walking around, and we use reinforcers such as little pieces of snack or maybe stickers or tokens. And then we fade our prompts and we fade our reinforcers. So we also work on teaching children to, to respond to the word stop if they happen to run away. So we have some children who might run, and at a distance they don't necessarily respond to this direction stop. And if they do, they don't necessarily wait for the adult to approach them to, um, to, sit, to wait for the adult to come to them once they've asked, been asked to stop. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip through a couple other examples here to show you another one. Again, these will be outlined in the PowerPoint that you can access at any time. But another area that we work on is teaching children when they go to leave the house, if they attempt to leave the house unaccompanied by an adult, what they would do is they would have the, t the parents would place a stop sign on the door with a cue that tells the child to approach the adult to communicate to the adult what it is that they want and where they want to go. And so in, in this example, we would place a stop sign on a door, tell the child to leave the area, to tell the child to go out the door, because we want the child to see the stop sign. As soon as he sees the stop sign, we have him stop leaving, stop opening the door, and to turn around to communicate to the parent what it is, that we, where he wants to go. So let's take a look at a video which will illustrate for you. So here you see a stop sign has been placed on the door, and a request to go somewhere is also attached to the door. Now again, the child doesn't necessarily have to learn, the child does not have to know how to read. This is just the communication card that he hands to his teacher or hands to, his, to the adult to indicate that he wants to go outside. Um, I'm going to move along through some of the information here on how we, uh, our study that we, that we conducted where we taught individuals to use cell phones to communicate that they were lost. You can access that study. I provide the reference. But I want to just address real quickly this idea of developing a safety plan for your child and what's involved in developing a safety plan. Because once you have a safety plan, you can then identify the skills you want to teach, and you can have the teachers who are the therapists that work with the child begin to teach some of these skills, and you can teach them as well. So there's a safety assessment that's available on the SPARC website that you can access for free, and I encourage you to use that assessment. It's not all-encompassing, but we'll give you some, some things to think about. I've asked everybody if they think of things that can be added to that safety assessment to contact me and let me know because I'm, I'm happy to, to make it longer and to add more things. I think it's, a, a real, it's really important that, that all of us kind of contribute to it so that we know some of the skills that we can teach to help children to be safer. 
So once you do an assessment, you can then identify, you can then develop what's called a safety plan, and that requires that you not only look at the skills your child should be learning to increase their safety, but what needs to be done around the home or in the community. So an example of a safety plan might be for John Smith here, who's five years old. What we do is we identify what the safety risks are. For example, he left. This is through parent interview. I find out that he left his house twice unaccompanied by an adult. He's opened the back gate in the backyard twice. He's been found playing with gasoline in the garage once. He lives near a busy highway. He will not wear his medical ID bracelet. He does not answer social questions. So these are all red flags for me that need to be addressed through a safety plan. Some of these are obvious. Playing with gasoline is a real safety issue. Leaving the yard is a real safety issue. But no one might think of identifying, well, he lives near a busy highway. That's going to be a safety issue, particularly if he's leaving or eloping from the home. If he's not able to answer social questions, he's not going to be reunited with his parent. So we get some, some information from the family. We identify what the safety risks are. We then identify home goals. And again, for this uh, student, these were some of the goals that we identified, to install alarms on the windows, to store the gasoline in a locked cabinet, to uh, put stop signs on gates, to run elopement drills, to have the child learn how to wear a, a, a medical ID bracelet. Again, I'm not going to go into these in great detail, but you can see we've been able to identify some things that we want to change around the home and skills that we want to teach. We identify community goals by stating that the neighbors should be provided with identifying information of the child due to elopement risks. Emergency responders should be informed due to elopement risks. And then we identify the specific skills we want to target. For example, wearing a medical ID bracelet, responding to come here, responding to stop, answering social questions, asking for permission to leave an area, avoiding dangerous substance. Again, these might be all skill programs that are addressed either at school or in their home therapy program. We then teach the family to run what are called elopement drills. Here at the school, we run elopement drills regularly for any students who might be at risk for leaving. So we have staff who wear pagers, and if we practice what to do in the event that a student happens to leave the building, what exactly are the steps? We encourage families to do the same thing in their homes. So we know, they know who's doing what, who has what role if a child happens to leave an area or if they find a child has gone missing. Okay, well that's all I have for you. We have some quest uh, time for some questions. Um, I'm happy to take some questions. I encourage you to look at the article that's on the Spark for Autism website that has a couple of helpful links and the safety assessment there as well. All right, thank you so much. Um, we we did receive a few questions here. We'll we'll try and move quickly. I want to um, make sure that we are um, on time here. So. Uh, one of the questions is, um, what are my rights as far as getting help from the school district with elopement issues when my child has poor frustration tolerance? Well, the, I would encourage any family that has concerns and, and wants the school or treatment team to address some of these issues. I would encourage you to talk with your your teachers of the child, talk, talk with the child's teacher, and to use the IEP process as a way to develop goals that the teachers will have to address. So the IEP is a contract between you and the school district that uh, outlines what's going to be taught for that coming school year and the strategies that will be used to teach the child. And so I would encourage you to use the IEP process. Now your your IEP might be a year from now or you might have already had your child's IEP, but it is a working document and you co can contact your child's teacher and the the uh, funding uh, I, in New Jersey, we call them child study teams. Uh, I uh, contact them and tell them that you're concerned about these things. And I, I, I think that my experience is most schools are going to be pretty receptive to a family's request to teach skills that might increase safety. I don't know um, under which conditions they might deny that. It might be too dangerous to teach certain skills in the, in the school, but to be able to provide you with some resources or support for you to be able to teach it at home certainly seems reasonable. But again, using the IEP as a way to drive those goals. Um, another question is, and this might be a tricky one, but how do you simulate walking outdoors in a traffic busy area? That's a great question, and um, obviously we, we, 
We don't do that here because of, of safety concerns, but we coach families about how to increase um, over time slowly those types of contexts. So, for example, it might be that families first are addressing safety on a sidewalk in a park where those kinds of uh, concerns are not there, where there's not a lot of traffic. And then as the child is more successful and the family is more confident and successful, they would slowly expose the child over time to uh, to contexts that might uh, look more realistically like a sidewalk that's on a busy street. But again, um, I would be working very closely with the family and securing the child's safety in those kinds of training contexts. And it would be, of course, with parental consent and making sure the child is safe. There are some studies now that are looking at uh, crosswalk safety using virtual reality. I didn't include any of the work on virtual reality, but I would encourage listeners to do a Google search on virtual reality and street crossing safety because some of the work that's being done shows some promise, although I don't know of any studies offhand that have actually uh, been able to to teach the skills that then lead to performance in those actual contexts. But look at the literature, look at it carefully, but it does seem to be a growing technology that might be helpful for us at some point. Okay, so we'll just do one more question so we're respectful of everyone's time. Um, you did talk about this a little bit, but do you have any specific suggestions for keeping uh, children in their seatbelt? Um, there are safety latches for toddlers that can go on seat belts that I know families have purchased. And so what sometimes we do is recommend starting with a, it's like a latch that goes over the the mechanism that, the button that that detaches the safety belt. So we have families buy those and we start with that to, to at least increase the safety during car rides. But then we would also run a program where we teach children through, again, differential reinforcement and shaping, where we have them have the seat belt over their belly and then they get a reward, then it's over their belly and it's lashed in and they get a reward, and we slowly shape their ability to cooperate and tolerate with a safety belt. But in the meantime, we have to increase the child's safety because he's not keeping the safety belt on, and so we have families buy these um, toddler uh, mechanisms that go over the actual latch. So you can you can Google that and find that online. I don't have those offhand um, in the talk, in the lecture here, but um, they do exist. Some families, teenagers I know have worn, some they on a bus wear a harness. Um, those, of course, are, are pretty big and stigmatizing, but some families have resorted to their teenagers with autism who might get up and not keep the safety belt on. They actually wear a harness that's latched in that's a lot harder to undo than a safety belt. Okay. So three so addressing it from three different ways. One having safety first and foremost during the ride, second is shaping their cooperation and their ability, and and the the skill of keeping the safety belt on and then three of course increasing safety if it happens to be a teenager by looking at other technology that might exist to keep them safe in the car. All right. Well, thank you so much.